uh, we go to the costs uh, that those wars, that military buildup is uh, making for most countries in the world. So David, David Pack is the chair of PeaceWorks Kansas City. Thank you, David. Uh, hello to all uh, from uh, the Kansas City metro area. Uh, I am uh, a long-term member of the Board of PeaceWorks. I'm actually the treasurer. Uh, and uh, uh, I was a long-term uh, member of the National Peace Action Board uh, ending back in about 2016. So we're happy to be here with you today. And uh, we are uh, in this session, as uh, uh, Susan said, going to be talking about uh, unsustainable costs of uh, nuclear weapons and military spending in general. And uh, I am uh, happy to first uh, introduce uh, uh, Lindsay uh, Poskarian. And uh, Lindsay is a uh, federal budget expert. Uh, she is the uh, program director of the National Priorities Project at the Institute for Policy Studies. Uh, and uh, I noted uh, looking at their website uh, that she has recently uh, put out a uh, publication uh, saying, sending Israel more aid now is a lose-lose proposition. So uh, she has also been involved, you know, in this issue uh, that we are, we've all seen uh, take such a role in recent months. So uh, I am uh, happy to, uh, to welcome Lindsay uh, and she's going to be talking uh, uh, about uh, nuclear weapons budgets in particular. Uh, and so I uh, pass it on to you. Thanks so much, David. And thanks to um, Mass Peace Action for hosting this today and to everyone um, for being here. It's a truly impressive turnout. Um, and I know that there's a lot of interest and passion on this topic. So um, very, very glad to be here today. Um, I'll start us off with I, um, just talking a little bit about um, where we are in our budget process. Folks probably are, are aware of this. It's been in the news quite a bit recently. Um, but there are two, when it comes to nuclear weapons spending, there are sort of two legislative processes that or really matter. Um, one of them is the National Defense Authorization Act, um, which is a bill that passes every year um, and was just uh, signed into law by President Biden for fiscal year 2024, which we're already in, which started in September. Um, and so that outlines um, nuclear programs and nuclear spending. The other process is the re regular budget process, which as folks know, um, there's tremendous drama happening in Washington right now. Um, multiple deadlines coming up and possible government shutdowns um, and uh, the House and Senate Republicans and Democrats have worked out top line spending um, but they have not worked out the details as part of that bill. So I'm going to kind of go back and forth a little bit about what we know about current nuclear spending and future nuclear spending based on that. But that's that's where we are right now. Um, is one of these one of these processes is complete for fiscal year 2024, and one of them is very much still underway. I have some slides I'm going to share to just talk about the um, the spending situation. So can you see these? Yes. All right. So this is just the larger context of military spending in the U.S. And this goes back, going back to 1976. Um, this is what our total military has spend, spending has looked like. And so for folks who are familiar with how this works, you know that there's a, the Department of Defense, the Pentagon is the biggest part of this. There's um, also the Department of Energy, which is where most of the nuclear weapons programs are. Um, and so this includes both of those. Um, and so what you can see here is there's a big peak um, in the 1980s uh, under President Ronald Reagan. There's a big peak in the aughts and, and around 2010, um, which was the peak of our post 9-11 wars. Um, and there's another big peak right now. And that's uh, last bar there, the Biden request um, 
the blue part of that is what Congress has already approved and, and signed into law under the National Defense Authorization Act. The orange part of that is the war spending that Biden has requested um, and that Congress has not managed to agree to yet. Um, and that's war spending for Ukraine. Um, that would be military aid to Israel. That would be um, some board, that would be, um, this doesn't include the border funding part of that. This is just the, the military part. Um, so what you can see there though, is that that is the highest spending um, throughout this entire period. And it's very, very close. Um, it's over $960 billion. It's very close to a trillion dollars um, just on the military and nuclear weapons. So that's kind of the, um, that's the background that we're operating in. Um, and then here's nuclear weapons spending. Um, and I actually had not looked at this recently and I was actually a bit shocked um, by just how far this has gone. And this is adjusted for inflation. I had to double check that myself because the way the trend goes up um, looks an awful lot like it might not be, but um, this is after inflation. This is the increase in nuclear weapons spending. And as you can see, um, since about um, since about 2012 or so, we have just been on a major increase in nuclear weapons spending. Um, so this is spending in, under the Department of Energy. This is the spending for the weapons themselves. Um, and it's the highest uh, that we have on record. Um, and of course, nuclear mm -hmm. weapons spending goes back further than this, a few decades farther than this. Uh, but it was it was never higher than this level. So we are at the highest level on record um, for nuclear weapons spending right now in 2024. Um, and as you can see, the trend is just going up and up. Um, so here, uh, that's one piece. Um, so this chart just shows nuclear weapons spending in the Department of Energy. That's the spending on the weapons themselves. But there's more than that. Um, there's also spending in the Department of Defense for weapons delivery systems. Those are the planes, the ships, um, the ground-based systems for um, intercontinental missiles. Um, and these are three of the biggest, um, these pictures show three of the biggest programs. So there's about $32 billion in spending um, in the Department of Energy for the weapons themselves. There's even more than that. It's about 37 billion total. Um, it's a little hard to say because some of the weapon systems are part nuclear and part not. Um, part of the deliver some of the delivery systems, you know, for example, planes that can either um, drop tr traditional missiles or can drop nuclear um, missiles. So, so some of these are are, um, but based on the budget request from the Department of Defense, we think that's about 37 billion dollars more. Um, in the Pentagon budget um, for these delivery systems, like the planes, the B-21, um, the submarines, like the Columbia-class submarines that are the new nuclear submarines, um, and uh, and the new intercontinental missiles, which are called the Sentinel. Um, and what I included here is pictures from each of the contractors, the main contractors, um, who are responsible for some of these systems, because I think it's really important to remember where this money actually goes. Um, so it goes to Northrop Grumman, it goes to General Dynamics, it's going to these contractors who are making a profit and who obviously have a very um, large interest in making sure that these systems continue. Um, I also think that the artwork, and it is artwork, it is, you know, these are artist renderings in many cases um, of these systems is is fascinating, you know, the beautiful sky behind, over on the right behind the intercontinental ballistic missile. Um, and I have difficulty using some of these images sometimes because of that, um, because it, it's so, it, it's just so incongruous to see that that beautiful sky there behind the intercontinental ballistic missile. Um, so that's where the money is going. It's going for these, these delivery systems, it's going for the weapons themselves, and ultimately it's going to the contractors. And then um, just to end on a note, because we always look at sort of how we're using the federal budget to keep us safe. Um, and this is a big part of what's happening in the in the budget process right now, where um, the domestic budget, um, according to the spending agreement between Democrats and Republicans in the House and Senate, freezes domestic spending overall for the federal government, but it increases military spending, including spending on nuclear weapons. 
Um, so I just wanted to, us to see kind of, you know, how is our government investing to keep us safe? And as you can see, spending for nuclear weapons in the Department of Energy, this doesn't even include the planes, the submarines, um, the, the Pentagon delivery systems, but it far outstrips spending for these other agencies agencies um, that are agencies that actually are responsible for public safety. Um, the Environmental Protection Agency, the Federal Aviation Administration, I'm sure folks have followed the incredible um, mis, um, misappropriation of, um, of trust by the Federal Administration, Aviation Administration that Boeing, again, um, for, the, for the second time in a few years, Boeing again has commercial planes that are um, unfit to fly and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And of course, we all know now that pandemics are one of the big threats to, to public safety um, and Food and Drug Administration. So as you can see, each of these critical public safety agencies has a budget that is far smaller um, than the budget for nuclear weapons. And it's important to kind of have that context and to realize that in a very real way, Congress is trading off these spending priorities. Um, and as we speak, they have chosen to freeze domestic spending, including spending that would cover these other areas um, at the same time that they have chosen to increase spending on nuclear weapons and the military. So I'll stop there and uh, I think, or actually one more um, to let people know about our website, nationalpriorities.org, where um, we have a calculator that you can use um, to, over the red circle, you can choose your state, you can choose your city or congressional district. Um, you can choose a program um, down below that. Uh, it's not always just military spending. You can choose nuclear weapons, for example, um, and then see what else the tax dollars could have paid for. So that's a very useful tool if you're writing a letter to the editor or if you're visiting your member of Congress um, or otherwise trying to explain to people what this actually means. Um, this can be a really helpful uh, way, to, way to illustrate that in your own state or in your own congressional district. So I'll stop there. And oh, thank you very much, uh, Lindsay. Uh, and I see a couple of people uh, who have questions. Uh, Ronald, uh, would you like to go ahead? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, all right. Yes, my name is Ron Betag. I'm from Houston, I'm a member of the Schiller Institute. I had a question um, regarding when the Soviet Union fell and um, there was a commitment, or at least an offered commitment, not to move the West e East in any manner. And that was then, as everybody here knows, violated. And there's been this commitment by this military industrial, but really financial uh, complex to continue colonialism. And my question is regarding one, the BRICS, the um, global South now in an open, revolt against the system for independence and development, and then linking that with the, the peace movement and the uh, ceasefire movement, you've got the power globally to actually reorganize this financial structure, actually put it through uh, retooling and then gear up these, as we just saw, there's a commitment to these wars. Uh, and it's it's from this financial interest to maintain a control. So things like the OASIS plan in the Middle East, where you develop the entire region by irrigating the whole place. So just wanted to throw out that as a question that you see the relationship between this financial blowout where like someone said, we're, you know, 34 trillion in debt, we've got a trillion a year plus a military budget as a, a waste. What's your uh, vision of that connection? And then this alliance I'm talking about where you link these various forces for development. Yeah, so I mean, I think that's, uh, and I'm I'm sure that earlier speakers would have had a lot to say to this also. Um, I, you know, I think all of those, in terms of how they could come back to affect the U.S. budget and what I was just talking about, um, those are very long-term trends and forces. Um, right now, there's very little in the way of international solidarity that is directly. Um, or, you know, those other other forces you mentioned that is directly affecting um, this budget process and how Congress is considering these things. Um, there is there are no mechanisms, essentially, um, to enforce international law on the United States, um, as we're seeing play out um, 
right now in the UN and has we've seen play out again and again before. Um, so, you know, so I think these are long-term forces and I, I think ultimately, um, you know, the hope is that through some of those those processes and through some of the, you know, greater organization and and power in the global South is that eventually the U.S. will be in a position where um, there is less option for um, the a U.S. administration and for the U.S. Congress to ignore those things or to ignore things like the um, nuclear ban um, that went into effect a couple of years ago, but to which the U.S. is not a signatory and obviously has no intention of, um, you know, the, the military um, elite and president and Congress obviously have no intention of um, of allowing that to change our policy. So, um, so, you know, I, I think I'm not sure whether it's an adequate answer to the question, but I am, you know, I think it's, there are a lot of parts of that, but I think the, the short answer is that those are all kind of long-term forces that I, that may play out in a certain way, but that for this year's budget process, for next year's budget process, very little of that is weighing on the minds of say congressional leaders who are cutting these deals. Just as a quick follow-up, you think that should be part of our role to actually make sure it happens? I think that's very helpful. Yeah. And and I think part of, you know, I think what does weigh on the minds of congressional leaders as they're making these deals is U.S. public opinion. That matters. Um, and so, I, you know, that our job is to help move U.S. Of public opinion and attention in a way that there's more of an interest in um in cutting these in these budgets. Um, and part of that can be solidarity with the global South. And I think we're, you know, for instance, we're seeing that very much right now with Palestine. So, um, so I think there is real potential for that. Um, but I think it's sort of a, you know, the mechanism is the global South is looking for one thing, people in the U S become aware of that and organize around it. And then there's pressure on Congress and the United States and, um, and the administration. All right. We, we have just a couple of more minutes. Uh, I know the next presenter is on tape and I've watched it and it's about 10 minutes. So uh, go ahead, Donald. Yes. Um, uh, I, I've been in contact with my member of Congress, Representative Adam Smith, who, who was former chair of the House Armed Services. Mm -hmm. He's no relation. But he, he tells me that he thinks the ground based ICBMs are a waste of money. And he says, but what makes, and I think there are probably lots of members of Congress who believe this, but they, what Adam Smith told me is that it's it's hard for him to make the case for that because because he said he says people like me who are, who say anti-American, you know, so we're, we're so anti-war and he, it seems anti-American. So a lot of the people in the establishment think that we're, you know, we're, we're extreme. So anyway, I wanted you to comment on, on, mm -hmm. you know, on the fact that I, on on how to uh, get Congress to to agree to um, that these facts that, and to expose the fact that there are members of Congress who agree with us on some aspects of this. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, and first of all, congratulations on having Adam Smith as your member of Congress. That was a a great um, person to be able to communicate with um, in recent years. Of course, now that the House is under Republican control, Adam Smith isn't in charge of the committee anymore. But um, but and Adam Smith is. It, is a really interesting case because he is a member of Congress who is is very reasonable about some of these things, but on the other hand, is also very supportive of large military budgets um, and very supportive of U.S. nuclear power and all of those things. So, um, but but that makes him an interesting case um, because he's not you know someone who's who's with us on everything. Um, I, I think I actually think it kind of comes back to the same answer as as the last question. Um, I think often we think it's our job to persuade these members of Congress, and that is one way to to get them to do what we want. But um, the other way is we don't necessarily have to persuade them of the merits. Um, we have to persuade them of the merits of public opinion and the merits of um, what will happen if their constituents don't like what they're doing. Um, and so I think what we need to focus on often in our actual day-to-day -day work and in, in influencing members of Congress is saying, hey, your constituents don't want this. Um, rather than this missile system doesn't make sense. Because I, I think it's true that a lot of members of Congress do recognize, for example, that it doesn't make sense for the U.S. to have um, the ground-based strategic deterrent or sentinel um, intercontinental ballistic missiles anymore. But that's not enough, um, as you saw, to get them to actually vote with us and 
um, and act with us. So what it comes down to is bring, you know, bringing more constituents, having more constituents, calling the office, all of that groundwork that um, that I know people on this call are also extremely familiar familiar with. All right. Uh, I'm afraid we really need to move on. I, I, I would, uh, maybe we can come back to the questions that are out there uh, after the next presentation, I hope. Um, you know, our next presentation talking about unsustainable costs uh, is the human cost of the war economy uh, by Shaley Gupta Varnes. Uh, Shaley Gupta Varnes is the policy director for the Poor People's Campaign and the Cairo Center for Religions, Rights, and Social Justice. Uh, she writes and speaks regularly on key issues around the interrelated crises of poverty, systemic racism, militarism, ecological devastation, and the false moral narrative of Christian nationalism. Uh, and uh, she's unable to be with us live, but Cole is going to share uh, a, a nice uh, presentation that she taped. Thank you, um, Massachusetts Peace Action, and everyone who's here today for, um, for inviting me to be part of this conversation. I'm sorry I can't be here uh, in real time, but I wanted to share a few thoughts on, um, on the human costs of the war economy, uh, a war economy that, as we all know, is gaining momentum and increasingly just going off the rails. Um, I think we're all familiar with Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's caution about a nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than programs of social uplift, how that nation uh, that does that again year after year is approaching spiritual death. And um, I've learned from Lindsay and the National Priorities Project um, that the U.S. has spent $21 trillion, $21 trillion on war, surveillance, policing, and prisons um, over the past 20 years. $21 trillion, not just on military defense, but on the militarization of our entire society, while life-saving programs to provide health care, food security, housing, and economic assistance have all been slashed. And so we must certainly be ever closer to that spiritual death that Reverend Dr. King warned us about more than 50 years ago. And I would say that today it's not even about spending more on militarism uh, than on programs of social uplift, but the rise in that spending that goes unchecked and unquestioned. There's just a blank check that's available at any time for the Pentagon and for war and for the military industrial complex. Um, there's you know, seemingly endless political will for surveillance technology and detention centers and policing and prisons. And that is what is bringing us closer to the collapse of our shared moral values, um, because that spending ultimately reflects a politics and a way of organizing our society that prioritizes fear and violence and force over community and, and diplomacy and peace. And by peace, I mean a true peace where, where all of our needs are met, where we are made whole from the failures of our society, where, um, as, the, as the poet Langston Hughes wrote, um, we have a peace that brings reality to our dreams, that serves humankind and shapes the common good. Um, and we're very far from that right now. Right now we have a democratic administration that is actively supporting and funding a genocide of the Palestinian people. Um, this is in contradiction to world opinion. We're isolating ourselves from our allies. Um, not now. It's losing support among Americans here at home, in part because we can see in real time what's going on and it's horrific uh more than twenty thousand civilians killed most of them children and women as well as journalists and aid have workers, you been listening you know, yeah mm -hmm. thousands of whom mm. thousands more sorry uh who are trapped under rubble um, while israel has cut off access to electricity to fuel to water and food and medicine and, and it's targeting hospitals and schools and refugee camps and civilian infrastructure that has led to the massive displacement of more than a million people. These, these costs of this war on Gaza and on Palestine, they don't just stay there. They don't just stay in, that re in Gaza. They infect the entire region. In fact, they're pushing us towards 
a conflict that could escalate even further. Um, but they also demean our, our common humanity. We can see um, every day in so many ways that this violence it goes on unabated and unchecked. And in a very tangible way, it affects our whole world. Uh, the, the emissions from Israel's bombardment um, just over two months are the equivalent of burning 150,000 tons of coal. These, these war emissions are, the, are greater than the annual emissions of many other countries um, over, the, over, the cost of, uh, over the span of a year. And so while this, this, you know, the Biden administration has, has continued to t throw down on its position for Israel, it has also cut access to, to healthcare programs, to Medicaid. It has reduced allocations for food stamps. It has cut other forms of assistance um, without raising minimum wages, without raising taxes on those who can afford them, um, revealing that, you know, once again, um, that we have, you know, more money for war, but not for the poor. And so it, it's in some ways no surprise that President Biden is losing support among voters. He's lost ground among black voters, among Hispanic voters, among young voters, among young progressive voters. You know, and meanwhile, on the other side of the aisle, we have a party that's been more or less taken over by a Christian nationalist movement, which I would say is another consequence of, of two decades of feeding the war economy. Um, and I describe it as a movement because it is. Uh, Christian nationalism is a political movement that is organized and funded around the idea that the U.S. is a Christian nation, that it is a white Christian nation, and that those in power should use their power to, to maintain and kind of broaden that, that, that vision. And this movement is wholly aligned with the rise of authoritarianism, with the demise of democracy and the use of force and power, um, including the power to pass policies that make life harder uh, for many, many millions of people to accomplish that vision and purpose. And currently, the Speaker of the House, the third most powerful position in the country is Mike Johnson, a Christian nationalist, someone who questions the results of the 2020 election, someone who believes in a national abortion ban, someone who believes that LGBTQ plus people are a greater threat, they are more dangerous than police armed with weapons of war. And so this political movement is organized, like I said, and funded it is organized into groups like the Moms of Liberty, a network of conservative women that has nearly 300 chapters in 45 states, whose members are being you know, elected to school boards and they're changing our children's education. They are very, very active at a community level. It is organized into other everyday institutions like churches, but also militias, right, who are ready to take this country back. Um, these are the costs. Alongside the human costs, these are the political costs of this war economy. And this is what happens when you prioritize force and violence and fear over meeting people's needs and building a sense of trust and faith in our institutions and our society as a whole. And yet, um, I can't leave it like that. I won't leave it like that because as high as the stakes are right now, and they are high, as close as we are um, to coming to that spiritual death, this is not the end. It never is because it is always darkest before dawn. And we do have some signs of hope, some signs of light to move towards amidst, amidst this kind of escalating darkness. In particular, we have this call for a permanent ceasefire in Gaza and this beautiful upsurge of activity, which is being led by those same young people who are losing faith in our elected officials. They are taking a stand for Palestine and for peace, some of them for the very first time. And this is a light in the overwhelming darkness. Uh, in December, I. Um, participated in an action in D.C. with Reverend Liz Theo Harris and dozens of other people in the Capitol Rotunda. And it was a group of um, executive directors and leaders of progressive organizations who are, in some cases, very new to the peace movement. And, and this, too, was a sign of hope and light in the darkness, this expansion of, of this movement. The fact that labor unions have thrown down so hard for ceasefire, for a permanent ceasefire, including the UAW, the largest union in the nation, even though President Biden came out to support their strike in the fall, they are seeing past those politics and they are pushing back on this administration, calling for a ceasefire now. And this is a sign of hope and light in the dark. The fact that poor people who are losing their health care and doctors and nurses who are seeing the effects of that on, on various health crises that are unfolding right now, that they are coming together to call for a permanent ceasefire and join this movement for peace. This is a sign of hope and light in the darkness. There is hope and light in this revival of the peace movement. 
And I have not forgotten that there is hope and light in the fact that those of us who have been around for a minute or for a few years or for many years, that we are still here nurturing this revival, nurturing this new leadership, offering the lessons that we have learned from our own experiences and from movements past so we can build this one even stronger. Because as we know, there will be setbacks, there will be challenges. The forces that we are up against are not backing down. But then again, neither are we. We are here, we are here for peace, and we are in it for the long haul. And this is a sign of hope and light in the darkness. So thank you for being here and thank you for this time.